Good morning, Faith Harvest. Wow, it's beautiful around here, all lit up for Christmas. We are in the space right now where we are going to join the prophet Isaiah in proclaiming the great truth that the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. We will call him Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. If that means something to you that Jesus is with you right here, right now, can you just proclaim with me, God with us? Let's say it together. God with us. How beautiful that is. And that's why we celebrate today. In fact, we're going to be celebrating all month. If you'll notice, look around you, there's these cards. We are going to have treats and festivities each Sunday through December, including and especially our December 24th Christmas Eve service at 11 a.m. Please don't miss that. Also, um, we have extra cards. If you want to invite friends and family, stop at the welcome desk, get a handful and take those with you and give those out to everyone. Uh, if you're a visitor, can we give our visitors a great big hand, hand clap? Welcome home. We would love for you to join us by uh, filling out this card right here in the seat back pocket in front of you. Or you can scan the code uh, on the app or on the website. And that gives us your information just so we can reach out and say hi. It doesn't go on any mailing list or anything like that. Uh, join us this Wednesday evening for our first Wednesday service at 7 p.m. You don't want to miss that. Youth, kids, adults, join us this Wednesday for a very special first Wednesday service. Women of Faith, join us this Tuesday morning for a Rise Intercessory Prayer. That's happening at 10.30 a.m. Now this one I'm going to read because the students, any refuge students over here? Oh, they are so pumped and awake. We are inviting all adults here in Faith Harvest to uh, attend the, uh, the event and simply shop. Refuge Student Ministry is asking for the adults of Faith Harvest to walk around South Point Mall. Sounds easy enough. And shop while the students try to find you on a scavenger hunt and recognize you from the church. Kids from Refuge will hunt and find you and get points for finding you. you if you want to sign up for this, go online on our website, um, on our app, and you can sign up for Mall Madness. Students, make sure you don't miss Mall Madness. This is a great way to build community, and once again, you can sign up for that. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to worship today? Let's pray. Father, we join you we join the angels in heaven who are, who are calling out holy, 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 who are proclaiming the name Emmanuel, Jesus, God with us as we join them in worship. Please, Lord, as the audience of one, participate. Enjoy the worship that we all bring now in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone declared. Amen. Would you welcome to the stage the Faith Harvest Worship Team? I want everybody to stand to your feet. You all ready to praise our Savior this morning? Jesus, you're worthy of the glory. Worthy of our praise. And 
There's a faith that stands defined. This is Goliath to his knees. I've seen his praise and rabble shackles right off my feet.
It's you who shut the lion's mouth It's you who let the captives out It's you who put the giant down And you stand in with me now We just a word the wind
Father, I thank you this morning that we stand on a firm, solid foundation. The truth of your promise, of your word. You are mighty, God. You are holy. You are strong and powerful. Bless your holy name, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are faithful. You are so faithful. Bless the Lord. Come on, can we lift up a praise offering? to the Lord in this room one of gratitude one of thanksgiving for the faithfulness come on a little bit more a little bit more let's fill the room with praise hallelujah Jesus you are good you are faithful you are holy <laughs> oh you are Jesus Come on, look at somebody around you right now and tell them this. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Come on. Tell somebody right now with conviction. You're going to make it. Bless the Lord. Father, we thank you, Jesus.
bless the Lord. Well, welcome to this beautiful, beautiful Christmas season. It is December 2023. Seems like just a few days ago, uh, it was January, and here it is, December 2023 already. Um, but we celebrate the goodness of God. In this beautiful December season in North Carolina, and it's 70 degrees outside. How about that? It may be 20 next Sunday, but it's 70 today, all right? Look at your neighbor and say it's 70 now. All right. So good to see you. We have, as uh, Pastor Jim said earlier, we got lots of exciting things we're wanting to uh, share with you during this Christmas season on these Sunday mornings during December, a time of celebration. It is a season to celebrate. Amen. And I'm so thankful for this beautiful season. It's a beautiful season not just for the church to celebrate, but it's a beautiful season for the church to share the love of Jesus uh, in the world around us with those that are around us. It's a great time and a great season to have opportunity to testify and share the goodness of God during this beautiful Christmas season. So I encourage you to seize every one of those opportunities that God gives you during this season to share of the love of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, and his love for us. Amen. So um, just real quick, a few things we want to do this morning just to make you aware of what we're going to be doing. We're going to have some special music for you. We'll have a special devotion as we begin Advent today. Our first uh, devotion today is on hope. How do you believe that hope is a powerful thing? Look at your neighbor and say, hope is a powerful thing. We have lit the hope candle today uh, for Advent as it begins but right now, one of the things we want to do, because we do this the first Sunday, for the first Sunday of every month, we receive our tithes and offering. And uh, so just in a minute, we're going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask everyone in the room that would to prepare a gift to bring um, of your tithes or offerings uh, unto, unto the Lord. And gonna, we're going to believe that God is going to bless you and increase you. But before we... Uh, receive our offering this morning. One thing I want to share with you really quick. One of the things that ministry does uh, and that a healthy ministry is doing is, number one, we're thinking about people. How do we best minister to the people that God puts in our path in ministry? Who are the people that God's put in your life, my life, in this ministry's life, in the life of Faith Harvest, who are the people that are here in our church family? So our goal is to minister to the people the very best that we can, to the best of our ability. And secondly, finding a balance of how do we minister to the people the best that we can and how do we create a space or a place uh, that is excellent for people to come and worship together. And so we, we work really hard to prepare a place, a building, a, um, and, it, and it's a biblical thing. It's all throughout scriptures. You can read it all throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, of a place where people gather to worship together. And, and, it's, and it's created as a place of excellence and a place that brings honor to the Lord. And so it's our goal to be able to provide for you a place that you can come and worship. And then thirdly, it's to fulfill our purpose. What is the purpose that God has given this church? The church here, Faith Harvest, but the church in general. How do we fit into the church to fulfill our purpose? How do we reach the people here? How do we reach the people into all the world? How are we doing that? And so all of those things require balance. They require strategy and they require finances. And so today I'm just um, sharing with you, ju just to make you real aware, aware and being transparent, just as your budgets have probably gone up at home, our budgets have gone up here at Faith Harvest. And, and to minister to people the best of our ability, to be able to provide a beautiful space and place for you to be able to gather and be able to fulfill our purpose, to reach people, because we do that. We, we not only are just ministering to people here, but God's given us passion and He's given us connections to reach people locally. So there's monthly 
connections that we have that we're reaching people locally ministering to people to the homeless and to our schools and and the many things that God's given us opportunity reaching into a home in Dominican Republic that God has given us the stewardship of to steward a home there of 35 children um, all these things require finances and so you may say well why are we receiving an offering doesn't the church have plenty of money here here's the thing it requires participation on your part so the church is not limited we have resources that come from God God but God uh, we uh, I've been pastor for 25 years but I've not yet had a Sunday that um, I walked in and money was just laying all over the floor that God rained down so it requires the participation of the people that are in the room. So the way that we're going to be able to minister to people effectively, the way that we're going to be able to continue to provide a beautiful place of worship that is an excellent and that honors God and reach and fulfill our purpose into the nations and into the world is the participation of people. So that's why we receive an offering. So this morning as I'm asking you to prepare a gift to bring, I'm asking you just to pray and ask God what he would have you to do and how he would have you to participate in this offering today so that we can continue to do and fulfill and find the balance of what God's called us to do here as Faith Harvest. Father, right now, I thank you for the people that are in the room. Without people, there is no ministry. The beautiful thing about the life of Jesus, when you walked in the earth, Lord, you walked among people, and you ministered to people, and you taught us so many things. And Father, I, I thank you for the people. And I pray, God, that you lay on their hearts how you would have them participate in the fulfilling of the purpose that you've given us as a church today to bring tithes and offerings as your word instructs us to do so that heaven will be open over our families and over our lives. We thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Can I get you to stand on your feet? Our uh, offering buckets are here ready. And I'm going to ask you just to bring an offering unto the Lord, not unto faith harvest, giving us unto the Lord, and God's going to bless you. Fathers, we give this morning, we give you worship because this is an act of worship. We worship you with our giving. And I thank you, Father, that there is abundance in our home, in this house. Every need is supplied for every family in this room, Lord. We speak that right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of the Lord. Open the windows of heaven, I pray, God over these families and over this house for your glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You can be seated. God bless you. As I said earlier, today we begin our first devotion of Advent, which today is hope. And so I'm going to invite my wife of 40 years who has exceeded my hopes and expectations in every way to share our first Advent devotion with you on hope. Pastor Lisa. Good morning, Faith Harvest family. Um, it's a joy and an honor to share hope with you today. I pray that this devotion encourages you and inspires you to spread hope. During a season that a lot of time people don't have hope, 
hopeless. So um, that's my prayer, that it encourages you to spread hope, to leave here today spreading hope. So uh, first of all, I want to give you the definition of hope. To believe, desire, or to trust, expecting or longing for the best outcome. Hope says the impossibility is a possibility that you just don't understand yet. Hebrews 11.1, 1, which is one of my favorite scriptures, says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hope is a blueprint of your faith. So give your faith something to work with. Hope and believe that all things are possible with God. Fear sees the now. Faith and hope see the future. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 tells us that we are not to live our lives like people that have no hope because our God can make a way where there seems to be no way. So today I want to just share a few declarations of hope that I felt encouraged and inspired to share. So first of all, I want to share the declaration of hope with the next generation. I want to say to this next generation, do not worry. God has you covered. He promised in his word that his truth will endure to every generation. I want to say to you, you are a child of God. You were created in the image of God. You are a Jesus follower, disciple, saved, redeemed, delivered, reconciled, rescued, justified, born again, sanctified, found, empowered, alive, chosen, victorious, and you are way makers. You are so loved today. Amen. You are loved. God chose you for such a time as this. To the moms and dads, the middle-aged, the seniors in the room, I want to declare this hope declaration over you. God has not forgotten you. You are you are significant. You are bold. You are seasoned. You are wise. You are disciple makers. You are caregivers. You are powerful examples. You are trailblazers. You are pillars in the church. You are homemakers. You are bosses. You are leaders in your home. And you are leaders in our church and in our community. To his church, I want you to remember who you are. His beloved worshipers, battle warriors, an exceeding and great army, your intercessors, your friends of God, your saints, your hope dealers, your redeemed ones, his chosen people, and you are the bride of Christ. The hope I'm speaking of today is for everyone sitting in this room. Always remember, you're not too lost for God to find. You're not too dirty for God to clean. You're not too broken for God to fix. You're not too hurt for God to heal. You're not too far for God to reach. And you're not too guilty to God, for God to forgive. You're not too sinful for God to save. So today is a good day. This is our declaration for today. Today is a good day for healing, for taking up our mat and walking, for throwing off gray clothes, to remind those in mourning you won't find the living among the dead. Today is a good day for letting go of the sin, twisting and tangling you up. Stop believing and entertaining the lies of Satan. Start choosing the voice of Jesus over Judas. The hope for tomorrow over the pain of our past. Today is a good day for freedom, for breaking chains and for setting captives free. Reminding Satan he no longer holds the keys. And death has no victory. There are no victims here, only victors. And we will overcome. Yes, amen. We will overcome. Remember our God is big enough to fill the heavens and the earth and Satan is small enough to fit under your feet. The first time Jesus came to earth, a few my I brought my tissues because I cry. The first time Jesus came to earth, only a few wise men knelt before him. 
But when he comes back to earth, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Don't spread lies and gossip. Spread hope. Go spread the love of Jesus and you will spread hope. Be a bright light in someone's day. Share a smile. Pick up the phone and call or text someone with an encouraging word. Be his light. Be his witness. Jesus is our hope. He is the hope of glory. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, and this is what I want to leave with you. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare. For good and not evil. To give you a future and a hope. So today, I want to leave you with this. Spend your life spreading hope and spend your life with people who spread hope. Be that person of hope. The acronym that I felt like the Lord gave me, and this is a challenge for you, the acronym of hope, help one person effectively. You may not be able to reach everyone, but you have someone that you can spread hope with. So today, when we leave this place, just realize you're not a person without hope. He is the hope of glory. I love you all, and I want to wish you a very, very Merry Christmas. God bless you.
beautiful, beautiful job, Michaela and team. And give it up for our amazing pianist, uh, Barry Collier, there on keys. Fabulous job, fabulous job. And wow, give it up for my amazing wife. Was that an incredible devotional hope? Wow. Ah, how do we follow that up? I'm going to share with you just a few minutes um, about hope. The world's looking for hope. If there's one thing that this world is searching for, it's hope. Something to believe in. Something to hope in. Something to expect. Looking to get hold of something tangible that we can believe could become our reality. So many times we look in the wrong places for hope. Anybody in the room guilty of that besides me? Sometimes we can look at people trying to find hope. Sometimes we can look at things and try to find hope. Sometimes we can look at experiences and try to find hope. And I can tell you there's no lasting hope like the hope that Jesus gives all of us in his word. Amen. Can we give God a praise for that? That there's no hope like this hope, his word. I just want to share with you a few minutes. Let me read a passage of scripture in Luke 2, 6 and 7. It says, while they were there in, in Bethlehem, speaking of Mary and Joseph, the time came for Mary's delivery. And she gave birth to her son, her firstborn, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room, look at your neighbor and say, no room, or no place for them in the inn. There was no room for them in the inn. So she gives birth to baby Jesus, the Savior of the world, and lays him in a manger. What an incredible story. We've heard this story. Anybody heard that story before? But it's so powerful. It's so life-changing. It's so true. But can you imagine Mary, who is going to give birth to a supernatural, it's a supernatural birth, giving birth to the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, because the Holy Spirit came over her and empowered her in her womb to give birth to a child that would become the Savior of the world. So she and Joseph show up at the Holiday Inn, and there's no rooms left. There's no rooms in, the, has anybody ever gone looking for a hotel, and you just kept look, going from one place to the other, and there was no room in the inn, right? I remember one time, just real quickly, I, I remember being with my dad on the mission field in Dominican Republic, and we were in an outdoor crusade, and there were thousands of people that were gathered there, and prior to that service, we went looking for a hotel in this small little town on the Haitian border. And we found one small place, but there was no room. No rooms. So we, the, the interpreter for us gets up that night, and he announces to these thousands of people, we have these guests, these evangelists that have come from the United States, and there's no rooms for them to stay in. Does anybody have a place they can stay? That was scary to me. <laughs> Come on, be real. Be scary for you too. We had no clue where we were going to end up staying. But, but this one widow lady who lived alone in this beautiful little place, she came up and offered her home to let us stay with her. And I'll never forget staying in that home. She gave us the best bedroom. She gave us the one room with the mosquito net, which was a big deal. And it was just this beautiful place. She, she cooked for us every meal, gave us this beautiful place to stay. But it just ended up in this situation, we, had, we, had, we hit the jackpot 
of the right person who came forward to say, you can stay with me. Well, in this particular case, the Bible says that Mary and Joseph didn't have that person who showed up. They ended up in a stable, giving birth to the Son of God and laying him in a manger because someone said there's no room in the inn. During this month, I want, I've titled what we're going to be talking about the innkeepers. The innkeepers. You and I are the innkeepers. And what I really want to challenge you to think about during this month and during this series is, is there room in your inn for Jesus? Have you, are you willing to do whatever it takes to clear out some space to make room for Jesus in your heart and in your life. Well, that's a biblical thing because the Bible says in Ephesians 3, 17, then Christ will make his home in our hearts as you trust in Christ. So we are the innkeeper. Look at your neighbor and say, you are the innkeeper. Are you making room? Have you made space? Have you cleared out some of the clutter, some of the chaos, some of the stuff to make space for Jesus during this season? Have you made space in your life for him to fulfill his purpose in you? Have you cleared out that space? Because the Bible says here, as a, as, a, as a result of us trusting in Christ, him coming to live and make his home in us, it says as a result of that, your roots will grow deep down in love. You'll understand what love is. You'll experience his love. You'll understand how to love. You'll know what love really is because your roots will grow deep down into love as a result of making room for Jesus in your heart. He'll keep you strong. That's a promise. It's in Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. He'll keep you strong. You have the power to understand. As you make room for him in your heart, as you say, Lord, I'm the innkeeper. I'm making space for you in my life and in my heart. I'll do whatever it takes to clear out the clutter so that I can give you space in my heart. As I trust in you, he will make you strong. He'll help you understand love. He'll help you understand life. He'll help you understand the, the mess that's going on in our world. He'll give you wisdom and understanding to know how to do life, how to take one step at a time as you trust him. And it also says you experience the love of Christ. You know, last week I read a passage of scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. And I talked about last week, how do you know it's faith? Is it faith? How do you know when it's faith? And I talked a little bit about Noah last week and about how Noah obeyed God. And through his obedience, when it made no sense that God spoke to him that a flood is coming, he didn't know anything about rain. He didn't know anything about floods. He probably didn't know anything about building arcs. But God called him and he obeyed by faith to build something, to prepare for something he'd never seen before. So the first way we know it's faith is when you obey when it makes no sense. If you ever get to a place that when God tells you to do something, that you got to figure out a way that it makes sense and got to wrap your head around it, it's no longer faith. And the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. And let me just tell you something. Living by faith is not nearly as difficult as we make it. I want to talk just a few minutes this morning about a man and a woman named Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah. How do you know it's faith? The Bible says, let me just read this real quick scripture to you. In Romans 4, 18. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. Can I get you to look at somebody next to you and say, I'm going to keep hoping. I choose to keep hoping. Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become. 
not believing that he was and that everything that God had said would happen in that moment, he believed that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken even though he was about 100 years old. He figured his body was as good as dead and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Today as we talk about the word hope, I want to talk about this other word promise. Abraham hoped in a promise. Abraham hoped that he would become. Abraham is called the father of faith. An example of faith that we can look at. An example of faith that we can mold and shape our life after. An example of faith that we can pattern our behavior and actions after watching how Abraham responded. He's the father of faith. And the way that he lived by faith is he just believed the promise that God gave him even when there was no reason to hope. When there was no logical explanation, when there was no logical circumstance or situation that aligned with the promise, he chose to believe what God said. How do you know it's faith? When you believe the promise above your problem. When you believe the promise above what you see, what you feel, what you hear, and what you can touch when you believe the promise. What I'm challenging you to do today is to make room for a promise. In this book, There's over 7,000 promises. That's a lot. Anybody, just start counting at one and see how long it takes you to get to 7,000. It's a lot of promises. Given to us. God made promises in this book called the Bible to us. And you and I have to make room in our heart for the promises. In the 40 years of Abraham and Sarah's travel of faith, the walk of faith, they travel thousands of miles, thousands and thousands of miles by faith. But you know what it took? One step at a time. If you're having problems believing the promise that God's spoken over you because you can't wrap your head around the end result, you're going about faith the wrong way. You go about faith believing that you will become one step at a time. Well, I don't understand. That's faith. Keep walking. Well, I can't explain it. That's faith. Take your next step. Well, people want to know. People don't understand why I'm acting this way. That's faith. Take one more step. Just keep trusting. See, that's making room. You're an innkeeper of a promise. You know, the Bible says this. Hide his word in your heart. And so many times I've quoted this scripture, hide his word in my heart so that I won't sin against God. You know what? There's something called the sin of unbelief. 
And we can get into unbelief and we can get into the sins of unbelief, of not trusting and believing God because we got to wrap our head around it. It's got to make sense. I got to be able to explain it. Abraham, the father of faith, believed one step at a time of these thousands of miles that he traveled. He believed the promise of God and believed that what God said would come to pass in his life. He kept hoping even when there was no reason to hope. There's no logical explanation. No, I can't explain. Yeah, hey, you're going to have children and you're going to not just have one child. A whole nation is going to come out of you. Thousands and thousands. You're going to become the father of generations of families of faith from, from his time to our time. Generations of families of faith that are coming from a father of faith. That's going to happen. How's that going to happen? I have no child. I'm old in age. Sarah, my wife's womb is as good as dead. How's it going to happen? One step at a time. There's no reason to believe that that can happen. There's no reason to believe that I'm going to be able to have a, I have no logical explanation to explain to you how I'm going to get well because I feel sick. But there's a promise in here somewhere that says that by his stripes I am healed. How do I explain that? I believe that I will become healed as I trust and believe his word. It takes trusting and believing and being fully persuaded, giving glory to God, even when it's, there's no explanation. Yeah, well, I've got logical proof that that can't happen. When you got logical proof that something can't happen, what I encourage you to do is get some biblical truth yes. that it can happen. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. It's daily choices. Every day, will I take one step to trust and believe God? That's what faith is. Yes. You want to know if it's faith? Did you take a step towards Jesus today? Did you take a step in, a, in alignment with what God's called you to and the purpose that's on your life? Did you take a step in that direction? Are you trusting him? Hey, I'm just going to be really real with you. I've been teaching this message for a lot of years. Living this life of faith for many years. But I can just tell you one thing. You never will get to a point as long as you're on this earth that your faith will not be challenged and your faith will not be tested. Because there have been times just in this season that I'm in right now of my life where the enemy is lying to me and telling me things. Any, did the devil ever lie to anybody in the room? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If he's not lying to you, you better check your salvation. <laughs> because when you become a believer, you become a target. And he's going to lie to you, try to convince you that the word of God and the promise of God can't happen for you in your life. But when he, when he comes with lies telling you that it can't happen, or he comes with trying to bring to you proof of why something can't happen, what I do and what I've had to learn to do is I'm going to get some, yeah, devil, you got some proof, but I got some truth. And the truth always overrides the, the natural proof that the enemy brings because God's truth will supersede proof every single time. There is no way naturally that Sarah is going to give birth to a child. There's no way naturally that Mary is going to give birth to a child when she's never been with a man. It's not going to happen, but I'm telling you something. When God speaks it, and God brings his, he will bring his word to pass. Every word that he's spoken, every promise that you will put your foot on and stand on as your firm foundation, he will bring it to pass in your life. His word is true. When you get more excited about his truth than you do about the proof, then now you're walking by faith. Now you're trusting him that he is able to do what he said he was able to do, and he will bring his word to pass. Abraham believed. He hoped when there was no reason for hope. So what did he do? He hid a promise in his heart. 
He hid, he made room. He became an innkeeper for a promise. And he believed that that promise would come to pass one step at a time. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 11, it was by faith that even when Sarah, it was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and too old. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from one man who was as good as dead. Can I ask you this question? What's coming from you? What's coming from you? What is God doing through you? What is God bringing to pass through you? Because the only way he'll be able to bring anything to pass through you is, the, is by the life of faith. I'll share this last thing as I close. God promised in his word specific things. But then there's times when God comes to you and I as his children and gives you individual promises. Things he said to you that will come to pass. And it'll line up with his word. But he'll bring you this promise. And everybody in this room, I, I feel pretty certain, has some type of promise in your life that God specifically, that you feel that God has given you. Can I tell you something? This, this may sound a little out there. But with every promise, that, and I have Bible to back this up, with every promise that God gave you, He gave an anointing to bring it to pass. What does that mean? He gave the power and the ability to bring it to pass. A supernatural power and ability to bring the promise to pass. If you are so focused, and I am so focused on my ability that I can't give place to the anointing, I will miss the promise. The promise, when you become an innkeeper of a promise, you begin to cover that promise with God's word. You begin to soak it with an anointing. You begin to speak God's word over it. And faith and hope begins to bring that promise alive on the inside of you so that at some point it will come into fruition into your life and you will see what God has promised come to pass. But if you get so focused on your ability to do it and you forget about the anointing for God to do it, you will miss the promise. When I'm challenging you today to be an innkeeper of a promise, can I challenge you to be an innkeeper of hope? That when it makes no sense to hope, I have no logical explanation for this. But I know my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I have no logical explanation to this. But me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And you begin to speak God's word over your life. 
I have no logical way to explain this to you of how this will happen, but i got a promise in my heart, and I've grabbed it out of God's Word. And, and you begin to make those declarations over your life, aligning with the thousands of promises that God's put in His Word, and you stand in the morning, you say, by the stripes of Jesus, this body is healed. Today my mind is at peace, and I will walk in the peace of God that passes all understanding. Today the joy of the Lord is active in my heart, and I will walk and live in the joy and because of that joy I will be strong in the Lord because the joy of the Lord is my strength you begin to make those declarations those are promises out of God's word he wishes above all things that I would prosper and be in health even as my soul prospers so as I begin to speak those promises over my life I'm just taking one step at a time to believe I may not have a logical explanation my circumstances today may not look like they're aligning with that but I'm taking one more step of faith God I believe you God, I believe you. I believe what you've spoken, and I will bring. I believe that you will bring it to pass. I'm not talking about, this is not a message of hyper faith. If you've been exposed to hyper faith before, then I'm sorry, and I apologize to you. But this is the truth and the balance of God's word. He made promises, and you've got to believe what he said in his word if you want to experience what he spoke over your life. It's the truth. You can hyper anything up that you want to. But when it comes down to it, it is God's word that we stand upon and we stand fully firm on the firm foundation of his truth and what he's spoken and knowing he will bring it to pass in my life. If you want to mock his promise, you can. If you want to scoff at his promise, you can. If you want to balk at the promise, you can. But I'm telling you something, the promises are for you. And there's nothing that grieves the heart of God any more than His creation hearing His promise and walk away mocking and laughing at what God has promised. These promises are yours. And God said, I said it before you. The choice is yours. Life or death, choose. Because something's going to come from you. Something, if you want chaos to come from you, then spend your life gossiping and caught in drama. And you know what's going to come from you? Chaos. But spend your life speaking God's word and said, I don't know how, but I know God will. And I'm speaking his word and I'm trusting what he said. He'll bring it to pass. You know what's going to come from you? Peace. Can I tell you something? The chaos party ends. And all of a sudden you're left alone. But the peace party continues. And people will come and gather all from all sides to get to where you are because they're hungry for the peace and the hope that you are an innkeeper of. Can we bow our heads just a minute? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your power that brings your promises to pass. You are faithful. 